Hi YouTube, it's Kathy, and this is my weekly entertainment wrap-up for August 7th through 13th. This week I read three books, I watched four shows, I watched two movies, and I listened to three books. First this week I read Wake the Bones. This is a paranormal horror book that's set in a very rural small town where they grow tobacco and not much else. It concerns this group of friends which consists of two brothers, one other guy, and one girl. And the girl is kind of our main character but we also jump point of view at random. She was off at university but she wasn't getting the best grades in her program and actually ended up having to drop out. And she's back working on her uncle's farm with her friends. She's also picked up this new hobby where she scavenges for animal bones around the property and around the town and then actually resells them as art. And this only becomes a problem when one day her animal bones just wake up and start walking around the property and generally terrify her and her friends. That obviously means this has some magic elements to it, which means they probably should look towards the town witch to try to help figure out what to do about this. They also end up looking into her past to figure out why this might be happening in the first place. I felt this was just kind of okay. I wasn't super thrilled while reading it. It kind of jumped around too much for me to really care about the characters, if that makes any sense. Like, I wanted these characters to get through, but also by the time I really got into one person's perspective, it would switch and we wouldn't know what was going on anymore. And sometimes there were switches where I just didn't understand it went a certain way until I saw somebody show up again on the page. It was fine, but I wouldn't recommend you rush out to read it. Next we have a graphic novel called The Me You Love in the Dark. From my understanding this was five single issues and this is the bind up of those. Although this is volume one, I don't know if there's going to be any future volumes. This graphic novel is about an artist who needs a break from the big city and decides to rent this very haunted looking house and lo and behold it is actually haunted and she has to deal with that while she's trying to figure out how to paint again. It is a very short graphic novel so I'm not going to ruin the plot for you but I like that it gets more sinister and I really enjoyed the art and I really enjoyed trying to figure out how she was going to cope with this situation. Next we have a mystery from Argentina and that's Elena Knows. This was recently translated into English. English, which is how I'm able to read it. The main character of this book is a 63 year old woman with Parkinson's disease who is on a mission to figure out who murdered her daughter. Up until three months previously her daughter was her main carer, they lived together, they had their arguments and their disagreements but obviously she loved her daughter. And because the people in her town don't seem to believe her and because the police don't seem to believe her she is now on a mission to find somebody who she can basically call in a very old debt so that that person can use their body to to go around and investigate this death because her body does not cooperate. I thought this was a really interesting perspective. Obviously we don't see a lot of 63 year old female protagonists and I loved seeing that in this. I also appreciated the disability rep because I have only read one other book by one other person who had Parkinson's and that was Michael J. Fox, which I read last month and really enjoyed. However, obviously every single Parkinson's patient has a different experience and obviously his experience is going to be different from that of a 63 year old woman in Argentina. It was also very interesting that this book was split up into different sections based on when she had to take her pill. Ultimately, people missing the point while reading this might think that it's very, very slow paced, but that makes complete sense for the protagonist. And I really enjoyed seeing how this mystery unfolded and who she thought was going to be able to help her and why. If you're looking for a short mystery that's a little bit different, I definitely recommend this one. On to the shows I watched this week, we continued the second season of Westworld. We haven't gotten to the end of it yet, so I don't know how this one wraps up. It is definitely different than and the first season and I think I knew that going in. I think people had told me that it was a little bit different. And even though there is a lot of action, it still feels like this season is dragging a little bit. And I think that's because I just want to see this resolved one way or the other. I just want to see what is going to happen ultimately and what's going to carry us into the next season. That's not me saying I'm not enjoying it. I am, but I'm just waiting for it to get to some form of conclusion so we can figure out where it goes from there. As it turns out, for I think the first time ever, there's not one, not two, but three English-speaking seasons of RuPaul's Drag Race currently on. I managed to watch episodes from two of those seasons this week because one of them updates on Saturdays and I just didn't get to it. I'll catch up, it's fine. The first season I managed to watch an episode from is Canada's Drag Race. This was the fifth episode and it was the Snatch Game episode, which is always a fun episode. I'd like to note that early on I wasn't a big fan of Miss Fierce Delicious 
Rose just because I found her very, very annoying. But now that the show is actively giving her a villain edit, I feel even more like she's probably a good person and just under a stressful situation doesn't cope very well. And I can credit a lot of like looking at the production and seeing what the production wants me to think of these various queens. From watching this series on YouTube where this woman is going through and re-watching old America's Next Top Model episodes and just cringing at the crap that those models went through. And then also she occasionally interviews the actual models from the show and asks about their experience and the bad things they went through. So as I gain more knowledge about that type of thing, I bring it into things like this and just wonder how things are being manipulated slash how people just sometimes aren't great at working under pressure. Because my best friend was flailing about it and I felt like I had to watch it immediately, I also watched the first episode of the second season of RuPaul's Secret Celebrity Drag Race. This season is formatted a little bit differently in that there are nine celebrities, but we don't know who they are. They do all their interviews in kind of either black or you only see them shot from the back unless they're in drag. And then every week they put on a performance of their choice and then the people in the bottom lip sync for their lives, somebody goes home, and only at that point do we find out who the celebrity is, which I think is really cool. There is one person that I 100% know who that is. I knew from the voice, I knew from the shadow, I know from what he looks like in drag that it's the guy that plays Artie on Glee. It just is. There's also another person that I'm like 90% certain it's the guy that played Damien on Mean Girls. I could be wrong on that one. I'm not 100% certain on that one, but I'm pretty certain. It is going to be a lot of fun to see these queens revealed, and I do enjoy that they have female celebrities who are doing drag on the show as well. If you're keeping count from home, that means that this week I didn't watch any of Drag Race Down Under, but there are two episodes just waiting for me that I will probably watch while this is exporting. The other show I watched this week was the end entire fifth season of the Great Canadian Baking Show, including the holiday episode, which I gather is probably should be the end of the fourth season. I don't even know. It's obviously the holiday one for 2021, so I don't know why they format it that way. Either way, it's a delight. It's always fun to be back in the tent. The show is so wholesome. I love when contestants help each other. I love when they have these heartfelt stories about what they're making. I love just seeing the artistry of it. I love them just being like, what the heck is going on when they're given a technical challenge and they're like, I've never even heard of this. Let's see how this goes. You know me, I like my food shows and I love them extra hard when they're wholesome and you really get invested in the characters and seeing who's going to win. And then I love that they brought back the Holiday Baking Challenge, which is just one episode where they bring back people that were previously finalists in their season and they just do a holiday-based challenge. It's fun. And it's also good to see these faces again because if I walked down the street and saw these faces, I'd be like, that person looks familiar, but I wouldn't have necessarily remembered I saw them on an episode of The Great Canadian Baking Show. I wouldn't necessarily make that connection if I were just to see them in person, but seeing them on the show again, I'm like, oh yeah, that person is familiar. Oh yeah, I think I remember some things about that person. On to the movies. I watched this week, I finally got around to watching the 2021 version of West Side Story. I have wanted to watch this for ages and I finally just got around to remembering that I had access to it finally. And I was pleasantly surprised. Teenage Kathy watched a lot of West Side Story. I watched the 1961 version of the film over and over and over again as a teenager. There was a local production of West Side Story that was just phenomenal because I grew up in a place where the performing arts were just top notch and still are. And and there are so many good things to say about this one. I really loved that we got some of the original choreography again. I was able to pick it out. I purposely haven't rewatched the 1961 movie before watching this one because I didn't want it to cloud my judgment of this. I wanted to maybe go back and watch it afterwards to see if there were any nods that I didn't pick up on, but I definitely noticed some of the same choreography being reused, which I enjoyed. I also enjoyed the new character that Marita Moreno played, who was the person who played Anita in the 1961 film. They also took took anybody's from a tomboy to a trans boy and that was wonderful representation to see, especially because the actor is also trans. And some of the cinematography was absolutely beautiful. The shot that really sticks with me is when the jets and the sharks are going to the salt shed to have the rumble. It's dark outside but there's street lights and each of them has a big warehouse door open and it's just their shadows walking towards each other and we have a top-down view that shot will stay with me because that was gorgeous. I absolutely loved it. I was also very happy to find out that Ansel can actually sing because that would have wrecked the whole movie if he couldn't. I didn't know if he could or not. And upon looking up why I knew the woman that played Anita, I was very, very happy to find 
out it's from Hamilton and possibly some other things in the past as well but also the fact that she won the Best Supporting Actress Oscar and is the first queer woman of color to win an acting Oscar. I cried. <laughs> she also apparently hosted the Tonys this year which means I'm going to have to watch clips of that as well because I don't watch award shows but I will watch the clips from award shows when cool people are hosting. There's so much more that I could praise but there's so much to talk about in this video that I'm just going to move on. I very much enjoyed this adaptation. The other movie I watched this week also last night after West Side Story was The Gray Man. I had heard this is a movie and you know what? It is a movie. It wasn't the worst and it wasn't the best. It was definitely an action flick. It's definitely one of those I have a certain set of skills movies. But I don't think it was particularly terrible. I think that people have been like too much action not enough script and you know what? It seemed about the appropriate proportion for an action flick like this to me. The one thing that I will say is I didn't particularly appreciate the facial hair on Ryan Gosling or Chris Evans although at least Chris Evans gave him that douche vibe which is what you're looking for in this and this must have been such a fun role for him to play because because I'm sure that he is a little bit sick of having to be the super wholesome Cap character and he's just excited to be the worst person, the biggest of jackasses, and he played it really well. It was fun to see. Also, I've been a fan of Ryan Gosling for a very long time. He played the character on Breaker High that I really wanted to hold hands with when I was in my early teens, so like, I've been following him for a while. There was also a moment where I just looked at the screen and was like, damn, why do you look like you're photoshopped again? Like, what is that six pack? action he's got going on. Is that real? I don't understand when muscles can do that. It had tons of cool action. The dialogue often had callbacks to different things that happened in the movie and was echoing them. It wasn't terrible, guys. It wasn't phenomenal. It wasn't my favorite ever, but I was expecting to hate it, and I didn't, so that's good. On to the three audiobooks I listened to this week, the first one being A Rogue of One's Own. This is the second in the series by Evie Dunmore that starts with Bringing Down the Duke, and this follows one of the characters that we met in that first book. Lucy comes from the upper crust of society, but she was kind of cast out by her family because of her activism, and because that she's kind of been on the shelf for quite some time, and she does not expect to be not on the shelf. However, this doesn't really bother her because they still haven't been able to get Parliament to overturn the act, whereupon when women marry men, the men automatically take all of their assets. She and her group of feminist friends are still trying to work towards this goal when somebody from her past comes into town and becomes a little bit of a thorn in her side because she's never really gotten along with him. But he just keeps popping up and being there everywhere and getting in her way. However, from the prologue, we know that he has had the odds for her since they were kids and they first met, so we obviously know where this is gonna go. What can I say? I found this utterly delightful. I have the third book on the series on hold for my library. I will eventually read that as well when it comes in as a hold to me. This was just absolutely delightful. I love that there's always this kind of ultimatum and at first you're just like, uh, this is gross and I hate it because of this ultimatum. But then you also see that everything is actually done with consent and people aren't actually pressured into things, which good. There's also this other really lovely scene where it finally clicks for him why she's doing what she's doing and I really like seeing those wheels turn and that come into play. Because when a character realizes an injustice and then goes to try to fix it, I just fall in love with them immediately. The next book I listened to this week was The Removed, and I actually listened to this all in one sitting, so it's a little bit of a blur. This is a book that centers around the members of an indigenous family. Fifteen years previous to the present, one of those family members was shot and killed by a cop who definitely did it for racist reasons, but then of course didn't so much as get a slap on the wrist for his hasty actions. Now the book is following the parents and the siblings and the ancestors of this boy as it's coming up onto the 15th anniversary of his death. This book is a testament to institutional racism and all of the effects of that and it was very powerful to see it played out through these various different characters. Although this book does have a plot, this is definitely more of a character study and for the longest time I would see people being like, do you like plot heavy books or character heavy books? And I'd always be like, you need both of them, obviously. And this is one of the examples of a very character heavy book. Obviously things happen and obviously you're going to want things for these characters because you're spending so much time with them and you just want things to be okay and whether or not they're okay 
kind of depends on which character you're talking about. And even if they are okay, are they actually really okay or are they just surviving okay? This was an absolutely powerful book and I highly recommend it. By chance, the very next audiobook in my queue from the library was Highway of Tears. This is a non-fiction true crime book about the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls along the Highway of Tears, which is Highway 16 here in British Columbia. Something I really appreciate about this book is it treats the victims and the families of the victims with so much respect and care. It just wants to get their stories out there clearly and know that these are people who who are absolutely missed. The vast majority of these cases are unsolved and that is just infuriating. For those who don't really know the geography of British Columbia, Highway 16 is a very rural highway. It doesn't really have cell service the whole time. A lot of these disappearances happen before people would be carrying cell phones anyway. And there isn't readily accessible public transport to get from point A to point B on this. So if you don't own your own vehicle, which many people don't because it's an expense that many poor families don't have access to, the best way to get through this highway is hitchhiking, which is a practice that is just a way of life up north. Many people hitchhike all the time, but the media has decided that because these women were hitchhikers and also because these women were indigenous, they were just asking to go missing, and that's so infuriating. This book goes into very heavy detail on a large handful of these cases where the author spoke directly to the families and it also talks about these systemic issues that have led to so many people going missing and being murdered. And honestly, if you come from a colonist society and you live in North America, you should be reading this book. I'm not saying we all knew this was happening and we did nothing, but we need to know what is happening so we can figure out how to change it down the line. And that's it for this week. If you've read, watched, or listened to any of these, let me know about it down in the comments below on the way down to the comments. If you hit that subscribe button, that would be very nice of you. If you don't feel like leaving a comment, but I want to make sure that I know you were here, just leave me an emoji or a smiley face if you happen to be on your keyboard. Some people have asked if there's a way to financially support this channel, so I set up a coffee account, which is a digital tipping service. The link for that, as always, is down below. You can like and share this as you see fit, and I will see you very soon. Bye!